Welcome to this service from the Pitt Street Uniting Church. We are gathering online instead of meeting together during this time of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. We offer this service of worship as an opportunity to take some time out of your day and join with others in faith, hope and love. This week we invite you to join us as we reflect on the presence of the Divine Spirit within and around us. Light breaks through and the long dark night fades. Warmth fills the chilling void and colour replaces grey shadowy hues. Longing gives birth to bleary-eyed hope and the new day dawns bursting with life abundant. However the night may have been for us, the day promises a fresh start as the spirit swirls in and around us, poking at every sleepy corner, tickling every silent space, making ready for the new day ahead. The creative one is here and present and alive, and she is calling us to join her in the dance that is life. Let us worship God. thousands of years, Indigenous people have walked in this land. This service is recorded in the homes of various members of the Pitt Street United Church community across many lands of Australia's First Peoples. And we invite you to name the Indigenous land on which you are today. These many lands were taken from the First Peoples without their consent, treaty or compensation. The Spirit of God has long dwelt with the First People of this ancient land. We honour the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on which Pitt Street Uniting Church building is situated. 
and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. The Uniting Church is a safe place of doubts and confusion and messiness for all people to worship, regardless of race, creed, age, cultural background or sexual orientation. God welcomes us in our collective and individually unique humanness. In the midst of all the challenges that confront us, we celebrate that we are not alone. In the mix of all that confuses and constrains us, we celebrate that we are not alone. In the solitude of each day lived in isolation, we claim the light that promises to shine in our moments of darkness. And again, we celebrate that we are not alone. We light the Christ candle, symbol of divine light, shining in the darkness, helping us find our way. We also light a rainbow candle for the children and young people among us whose future is dependent upon love finding a way in the world. Let us pray. Life-giving presence, as the disciples struggle to understand your promise to send a helper after you are gone from their side, we struggle to understand all that is happening around us and wonder how it will end. Help us to recognize the presence of your spirit in the world. For we confess there are times when we fail to see and recognize the signs before us. Grant us the courage to follow in the way, despite misgivings of our ability or strength or understanding. Help us to know it is not faith in ourselves that is needed, but faith in you to be with us on the journey as you have promised. The Spirit is alive and living within and around us. At the right moment, the signs will be clear. Take heart, look up and see. As sure as each new day dawns, so God's presence is real. Here to guide and inspire us. Thanks be to God. Remembering Jesus, we pray together. God, you are life for us. Holy be your name. Your new day come, your will be done, on earth as in your vision. Give us this day our bread for the morrow, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Strengthen us in the time of test, and deliver us from evil. For the power, splendor, and the fulfillment are yours, now and forever. Amen. Like a tree that stands by the stream Send deep your roots to the water Be not afraid of the weather that comes You will bear fruit if you trust in my love Like a tree that stands by the stream Send deep your roots to the water Be not afraid of the weather that comes You will bear fruit if you trust in my love Like a tree that stands by the stream Send deep your roots to the water be not afraid of the weather that comes. You will bear fruit if you trust in my love.
I invite you now to share a sign of peace with those in your household or to offer a word of peace to the world. May the peace of the Divine Presence be with you. And also with you. Listen for words of wisdom and insight as we read an excerpt from C.S. Lewis's It Will Be Morning. It will be morning. Christ says, Give me all. I don't so want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires you think innocent, all the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. I'll give you a new self instead. In fact, I'll give you myself. My own will shall become yours. Both harder and easier than what we are all trying to do. The real problem of the Christian life comes where people don't continue looking for it. It comes the very moment you wake up in the morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists simply in shoving them all back, in listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other, larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. And so on, all day. Listen for words of comfort and assurance of the Spirit's presence with us. If you love me and obey the command I give you, I will ask the one who sent me to give you another paraclete, another helper, to be with you always. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot accept, since the world neither sees her nor recognises her, but you can recognise the Spirit because she remains with you and will be within you. I won't leave you orphaned. I will come back to you. A little while now and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live and you will live as well. On that day you will know that I am in God and you are in me and I in you. Those who obey the commandments are the ones who love me. And those who love me will be loved by Abba God. I too will love them and will reveal myself to them. Thanks be to God. It seems a bit odd. Here we are in the season of Easter. And yet we listen to the climax of Jesus' farewell speech to his disciples at the Last Supper. We're back in pre-crucifixion days while celebrating resurrection. What does this reading have to offer us in this Easter season? And what does it have to offer us in these days of COVID isolation? Easter is about encountering the risen one well illustrated in the familiar post-resurrection stories like Mary of Magdalene at the tomb, the disciples in the upper room, and the two on the road to Emmaus. But I also note that these resurrection encounters emerge from places of grief the disciples were immersed in. So for me, Easter is not just about encountering the, the risen one, but doing so even while dwelling in grief. Easter is about making meaning in our lives, and even amid change, loss and grief. Grief that begins to make sense is an experience of resurrection. 
life through death. Let us return to the Gospel of today. Jesus, on the eve of his death, says to his disciples, I will not leave you orphaned. I was surprised with the force that these words hit me. I will not leave you orphaned. In 1989, Julia, the eldest of my three children, was not yet three. Layla, who had, until recently, been the family day carer of both Julia and Maria, died unexpectedly. I was driving with the children. I don't know why, but those deep and meaningful questions are asked when one is driving. Julia says, Mummy, promise me you will not die. How do I, as a new mum, answer such a fear-laden cry? Darling, I cannot promise you that I won't die. I will die one day. We will all die sometime. But I hope it will not be for many years when you are grown up. Fortunately, my answers seem to reassure her. Julia was afraid of being orphaned, although that word was not part of her vocabulary. The fear of being orphaned is surely one of the universal fears of humankind. Not necessarily the fear of our parents dying, but the fear of isolation, abandonment, chaos, loneliness, vulnerability in all its guises. Fear that by ourselves we are not enough, for we are not created to be self-sufficient, but for relationship. Jesus draws on this potent metaphor. On the eve of his death, Jesus wanted to offer reassurance to his disciples, just as I wanted to reassure my daughter Julia. Jesus has no doubt that those whom he loved would be filled with fear and terror in the days ahead. They would be vulnerable and panic, so Jesus was both preparing them for the inevitable and doing what he could to mitigate it. He assured them that, they, that he would not leave them orphaned. I notice that Jesus does not say that they will not be orphaned, but that he will not leave them orphaned. As we know from the various accounts of the resurrection, the disciples initially felt intense grief of being abandoned. Many of us are familiar with the five stages of grief identified by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Anger, denial, depression, bargaining and acceptance. And maybe we can see these in the resurrection stories. Was Mary angry when she found the tomb empty? Where have you taken my Lord? Were the disciples depressed when they walked along the road to Emmaus? Or the twelve who were locked in fear in the upper room? Was there some level of acceptance when Peter and his mates were back fishing on the Sea of Tiberias? These emotions come with being orphaned. There's a lack of the abundance of life that Jesus has promised. But he did not say you will not be or feel orphaned. Rather, Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned. So what is on offer? Jesus offers to send a paraclete, a comforter, encourager, helper, an advocate, which he calls the spirit. This paraclete will offer what Jesus has been offering the disciples. The spirit will continue the work of Jesus. In Finding Meaning, the Sixth Stage of Grief, David Kessler extends the work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, with whom he worked, adding another stage to help understand grief. He says acceptance is not enough. We need to find meaning following bereavement, be that death, divorce, drought, bushfire, unemployment, yes, even a pandemic. Does the paraclete that Jesus spoke of, the spirit, appear in different guises at different times? Could the spirit be the meaning making that David Kessler seeks, sees as so important in healing grief? The arrival of the paraclete ensures that the revelation of God in the incarnation does not end with the death of Jesus. Jesus says, you will know that I am in God and you are in me and I am in you. This promise of union with the divine is the hope that Jesus offers. I now need to return to the beginning of today's gospel passage. Jesus says, if you love me and obey the command I give you, I will ask the one who sent me to give you another paraclete. I'm not a Greek scholar, but others inform me that the Greek indicates a condition of fact, not a conditional statement, 
So a better translation might be, since you love me, you will keep my commandment. We need to make sure that we don't turn it around. Jesus is not saying, if you keep my commandment, I will love you. He is simply saying, since you love me, you will be keeping my commandment. What is the commandment? Jesus never mandated that we keep the 613 commandments in the Torah, nor has his focus been on the Ten Commandments handed to Moses. We know from earlier in John's Gospel that the new commandment that Jesus gave was, Love one another as I have loved you. And Jesus adds, This is how all will know that you are my disciples, that you truly love one another. John 13, 14 to 15. Jesus is telling his disciples that it's through love, the way that he has loved, that they will come to experience the gift of the Spirit, that sense of not being orphaned. But what does Jesus mean by love? It's agape love, that unconditional love that he showed throughout his life. The love in which he washed the disciples' feet, including those of Peter and Judas. The love that Luke's Gospel describes when he announces his mission to proclaim liberty to captives, sight to the blind, release to those in prison. The love that Matthew's Gospel illustrates when Jesus talks of feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, visiting the prisoner and the ill. The love of intimate relationship he affirms when Mary of Bethany sits at his feet or when the woman washes his feet with her tears. The love of forgiveness on the cross. Jesus offers his disciples words of hope. He reminds them that since they are loved by him, they will be, keep his commandments, loving in all the ways that he loves. And in doing so, they will come to experience the presence of the Spirit. Jesus was saying that to experience the abundance of life that he promised, we need to love like he did. And in doing so, we are able to claim the fullness of life in the face of fear, terror, panic, isolation, loss, grief, that is the consequence of the very nature of our existence in the world. So how does this reading, how is this reading speaking into these COVID days of isolation and reorientation. It seems to me that we're needing to hear the words of Jesus, I will not leave you orphaned, that there is some meaning and hope amid the grief that many of us and the community may be feeling. The grief resulting from social distancing that has forced us apart from colleagues, friends, family for months. Disappointment has accompanied postponed or cancelled baptisms, birthdays, wedding anniversaries, funerals, public activities and experiences that may have brought us together in person have been abandoned or moved online. City streets are vacant, businesses closed, public transport empty, perspex protective screens distance us from cashiers in the supermarket. We stand at arm's length from people in queues and eye off the stacked tables as we pick up our takeaway coffees to sip on our lonesome. We grieve for the world, the deaths of more than a quarter of a million people, the almost one million in our country who have lost their, la their jobs due to COVID-19, the plight of asylum seekers and those on temporary visas with no access to welfare offered to Australian residents. This grief is on top of the grief we already are feeling because of drought, fire, flood, the grief associated with climate change and callous disregard for the environment resulting from dysfunctional economic and political systems. We're collectively grieving the world we have lost. We can look to the Gospels as a past memory of some historic event 2000 years ago, some sentimental story that makes us feel good, or encounter the sacred words that speak into our present reality words that challenge, guide and nourish our lives. Some of us may recognise that we've been experiencing anger, denial, depression, bargaining and acceptance over these past weeks. And yet today's gospel is inviting us, when the time is right, to find meaning in the global pandemic, or as Gareth described last week, being thrown off our guard at this time. This may require a reassessment of the way that we live 
individually and collectively. Some of us may already have begun to find signs of resurrection. The quieter pace of life enables us to recenter our lives. Our daily walks among nature offers us a feeling of kinship with the entire breathing world as we listen to bird songs, coming to a deeper appreciation of our entanglement with all that surrounds us. Some of us may be savouring this apprenticeship with slowness, establishing deeper bonds of intimacy with partners, children, neighbours, lower kids and eucalypts. Some may be finding meaning through the deepening of relationships with the Pitt Street community, visiting the sick through mailing a card, feeding the hungry by dropping off groceries, while others through acts of service in the wider world. None of this is to deny or diminish our grieving, rather it's an invitation to seek life amid death. When we love and sense that we are loved, we no longer feel orphaned. We keep the commandment. We love God, love our neighbour and love ourselves with our heart, soul, mind and strength. This love grows, expands and transforms self and the world such that the words of Jesus you will know that I am in God, and you are in me, and I am in you. We encounter the risen one. No, one. no longer stuck in grief, we will see and live differently. We truly experience resurrection amid COVID isolation. And this is the antithesis of being orphaned. Divine Spirit, constantly with us and all of creation, we thank you that we are not alone in this world. You are present and active in every moment of every day, in every place, in every valley and on every mountain, in every town and field, in every city and laneway. Creator of all that is, 
you sustain and energize us for life, and we give thanks. Compelling love, you call us into community and gift us for life together. And yet we know what it is to live in isolation, to wake each morning and know that our experience of life today will be limited by the walls around us, untouching spaces between us, and faces on screens reminding us of distance, such is the blight of a pandemic infecting the world. There is no place on this earth right now, no person of any age for whom this virus is not a threat. And so we pray for those who today are struggling for their very lives, those infected and hoping to shake it off, those living differently to make life safe. It is a constant struggle requiring perseverance. We pray also for the far too many who have the added burdens of no or poor sanitation, no access to clean water, no home or income and insufficient food, large numbers living in small quarters, the poor, the infirm, the dependent, aged, the unemployed. We give thanks for all who continue to work in changed and stressful circumstances to keep essential services going. We think of cleaners and laborers, drivers and delivery people, online workers and repairers, teachers and medical staff, researchers and governments, collectors of our rubbish, and all who continue to farm and produce our food. They live with the same threat and yet continue to serve. May they know your life-sustaining presence and cheerful thanks of every one of us who depend on them. At this time, we take a moment to raise our specific and personal prayer concerns. In our circle of prayer today, we remember the lands and people of Indian Ocean Islands, Comoros, Madagascar, Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles. We are thankful for how people who are ethnically and religiously diverse have long lived together. We pray for the fragile environment and unique plants, animals and lands that they will be protected, especially as the sea rises. Here in Sydney, we pray for the people and ministries of the Uniting Congregation of Paddington and their minister, Reverend Danielle Hemsworth-Smith. Loving Spirit, grant us the wisdom and temerity to claim our place with you and inspired and empowered to work for the healing and well-being of all people and for the earth itself upon which we absolutely depend. Amen. This is normally the time we will bring our offerings. We give thanks for those who have taken steps to do so via direct debit, and so continue to be a support for the work of the church. Its work has not stopped. We dedicate our offerings and seek inspiration as we work with hands, hearts, and minds in community for the community into which the spirit gathers us all.
Go into your day and know you are not alone. And may the love of the Creator, the grace of the Only Begotten, and the inspiration of the Spirit be yours as you navigate this life and the world we share. Amen.